My name is Paul Ridding. I'm honored to be the moderator of our 1045 session involving two amazing uh, leaders from uh, island states in the Pacific. Our first, um, our first presenter will be, let's see if I can get some information up. From the Federated States of Micronesia, Senator George. Sasaki George was raised in uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, learned how to read the Bible and the religious books. He attended Texas A&M. Those Aggies at Texas A&M? Instead of French, Texas A&M All right. Um, Louisiana State at Baton Rouge and the University of Hawaii. He then returned to uh, Micronesia where he was a high school teacher, a legal service attorney, and he is currently a state senator. And um, he has ad was admitted to practice law in the year 2000 and was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's married to his lovely wife, Jessamine. How are you today? They are the parents of seven children and seven grandchildren. Congratulations. Our second presenter is uh, His Honor Lord Fatafei Fakamfanua. Sorry about that. We sat with each other for an hour yesterday. I still can't get it right. I forgive you. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's what religion's all about an incredibly uh, powerful resume as well, uh, becoming a member of parliament in the Kingdom of Tonga at the age of 24, three years later. I don't know what you were doing when you were 27 years old, but he's the head of the, of the political uh, government in, in, in parliament at that age. He spearheaded some major changes in Tongan parliament, including presiding over political reforms, advocating greater representation of women and youth, in Parliament, a reduction of illicit drugs, and during his term as Speaker of Parliament, uh, Lord Fakafanua sat on uh, many uh, executive branches. I had the privilege of having lunch with him yesterday. He is sandwiching this conference into uh, an incredibly tight uh, travel schedule. He started in Tonga, went to uh, Uruguay, Vietnam, New York, now you're here, Tomorrow you leave, or Thursday you leave for Morocco, back to Hawaii, and when do you finally get to go home and sleep in your own bed? Uh, 30th of October. Okay. <laughs> so he's been on the road for almost two months, and it was very fascinating for me to sit with him, and as we talked about individual liberties and individual uh, rights issues in our various countries, we, we are quick to jump on the bandwagon of, you know, things are going so bad. And the rising generations, they're so concerned about themselves and they're not concerned about society. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna solve it? And I said to him, with all due respect, your honor, your, your lordship, as a politician, as the top politician in, in your country, we believe that that might be the place for established religion to fix these problems to which he responded to me, with all due respect, Mr. Ridding, perhaps that's the place of Jesus Christ. And I thought that was very insightful. In the, in the Pacific area, we have experienced, I'm currently stationed in Auckland, New Zealand, as the area legal counsel for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have 17 countries in the Pacific area. I've only been there four months, but I've had a heavy dose of Many of the issues that we're addressing today and that we'll hear from Senator George and Lord Fakafanua, in one island country, uh, a, a couple of families decided to leave their faith, which was the majority faith for the country, and join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The village elders did not take uh, kindly to that decision and decided to double the taxation for these two families because they had left the village's official faith. And fortunately, uh, that, that issue was resolved without going to tribunals or courts. Be in a beautiful way, the islanders were able to address that issue very well. It wasn't Tonga, by the way, in case anybody was interested. 
Uh, in Australia, we face um, ongoing legislation. In, in 2021, the, ter the, country, uh, the um, state of Victoria passed what's called the um, it was a con it's, it's Conversion Therapy Act, where those individuals who want to be transgender or change their gender could, cannot be con coerced or persuaded by any individual that what they're doing is wrong. Which means that a faith-based organization if you start your lesson with, in the beginning, God created male and female, if you have a person in your congregation or in your seminary class or in your Sunday school class that is in the process of a gender change and that those words is offensive or harmful to them, in Australia, in the most extreme situations, you could be fined, you could face civil, civil uh, pi fines or even criminal um, measures. And so as faith-based organizations, we need to navigate excellent legislation that's trying to protect the LGBTQ community and their individual rights, but there's going to be some conflict at some point. We've had to advise our, our social service uh, representatives and employees and any other church leader that if somebody comes to them and they want counsel as to their gender transition, that they probably ought to say, I'm really not in a position and the legislation really does not allow me to talk to you about my beliefs because they may cause you to feel guilt and harm, at which point I'm in violation of the statute. Anyway, those are some of the things that we're looking forward to. And if you will give me just a second, I will put your presentation up. Would you like to sit there or would you like to stand up here? I'd like to sit. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and activate this, um, this microphone? So it is active and if it's, there's a green, or there's a button there, and if it's lit green, then you uh, can speak into it. Um, I need the button. Yeah. Yeah. Test. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to speak about the religious freedom in Micronesia. And I think the big thing or the important thing as to Micronesia is that the people understand their right, understand this right and, and use it for their good use it to advance their lives. We are, our lives there in Micronesia in these days, not as much as the government failing to protect them in this right. But I think it's more, it is more of a awareness and educating the people, the individuals in Micronesia to, to be able to understand this basic human God-given right 
and to be able to use it and live it. Let's start with the, well, let's go back. We're here, we're here in uh, BYU for this symposium, and I understand that it has been held every year for 30 years now. The United Nations have spoken on this basic right in 1948, and Kambang University has been doing these things. I think it's very great that this can be done here. And let me start by saying that I do not think this is a coincidence that we, each of us, appear here. I think this uh, issue is very, very important and that what, what is transpiring now is, has been, has been ordained or planned divinely by divine power. I think in the beginning, God gave this principle a divine gift for each person. Let's move to the other one. On our lives, when we were children, we were kids, we have times where we feel like we are left behind, we struggled, nobody is paying atten attention to us and we need help. This, this bird in Micronesia, the, the robin, I think, I think it's represent this feeling for people. That uh, the person has to, sometimes he, he realize he, he had rejections, uh, things like that, and then he, he will have to act for himself. And, and this freedom, this right gives him the the right or power to do this. Women in Micronesia, she has to work, work at fishing, work at the, at the mud, at the roots, to catch crabs, eels, things like that. She struggled and she live, live home if she needs to leave home and even leave the island to find places where she will have the opportunity, equal opportunity, to pursue, pursue a life, a better life for herself. Kosrai Island, where I live, was a uh, for a long time, I'm going to talk about a problem that I see in Kosrai, and Kosrai represents Micronesia. Kosrai was secluded for a long time, and then finally was the outside world come to Kosrai through the explorers, the whalers, and the missionaries. And then later, a lot of things were brought to Kosrai and the, deep, the people does not know how to cope with it. It's like they were living in one century and then suddenly they began to live in this 21st century. There, there were mental illness for people. I think this is solved with this problem. There are other problems also, but I think it, a young Gushayan man can get, get to pursue education, go to college, and hope to return home, to be able to help himself, help his family neighbor, 
in solving all the problems that uh, Koshai has. And of course, when he returns home, he can, he has to find a wife. And this wife is very important. He's the uh, help meet of the young man, and they have to have a very strong relation, relationship, a strong bond. The stronger the bond, the stronger the family will be. And if the bond is weak and breaks, the family breaks. They have the right and freedom to seek, seek the light, seek peace. And in searching for this light and seeking this peace, they can sing, they can march, giving praise, giving thanks. This is what these women are doing, marching at Christmas Day. The family is very, very important in Kushai, the basic unit of society. This is where, I think this is where this f knowledge of this freedom is fostered. And everyone in the family lives it. Learn, learn it. If, if it is spread across Micronesia or even in the world as each family, all family have this, that will be, that will be good in the land. It's gonna be very good. We, we will feel a kindred spirit. Because we are, both of us or all of us are in one family, the family of God. Also in Micronesia, I think teachers are very, very important. As one man thinks in his heart, so is he. That is stated in the book of Ecclesiastes. And I think we can say that as a man has good thoughts, it, it will do good. So we need, we need teachers. We need teachings to be able to have good thoughts. We need teachings from our father, from our mother, from the Sunday school teacher, school teacher. We have to keep deep and pull and make our lives go forward, not backward. I'm very thankful for this freedom and I'm very f thankful that we are here to address it. Each of us may go on our lives and be ready to assist that uh, our fellow man can also enjoy this right and the freedom. Thank you, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll have, if you have some questions about Micronesia and about his beautiful country and maybe what it's like to have had your island isolated for so many years and then thrust into the 21st century, we'll save some time at the end for those types of questions. Lord Fakafanua. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, God Almighty in, um, and also thank the organizers of this event um, for inviting me. This is my, my first time um, at uh, BYU and um, to be part of this symposium, which has been going on for many decades. Um, and it's the first time I've heard about it. And I'm very surprised because of the, the core of the topic. Um, should have come across my desk a lot earlier. But anyway, better late than never. Um, so thank you, Paul, for the, the extensive introduction and, of course, um, uh, explaining our conversation over lunch yesterday. <laughs> um, really appreciate that. I'm from a small uh, island kingdom <coughs> in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean, um, the kingdom of Tonga, um, small island developing state or large ocean state. Um, we have never been colonized. Uh, we are a population of 100,000 people. We probably have 100,000 around the world um, outside of Tonga. We're a largely homogenous society and we are bilingual. We speak English and, and Tongan. Our laws are passed in both English and Tongan um, written, but in our parliament where I'm speaker, uh, we have to make our deliberations in Tongan. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you to my fellow Tongan. Um, that was really good, and I'm glad you didn't trip down those stairs. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm very honored and privileged to be here um, this morning and also to present from a unique vantage point, and that is as a legislator. Um, and uh, in my career, I've been passing laws uh, for the past uh, 10, 10 years or so, and I've been Speaker of Parliament since um, 2012 um, at the tender age of 27. I'm now 38, and I'm still the youngest member of Parliament, which is why I advocate for youth in my Parliament. So I um, just want to cover four topics. Um, I'll briefly brush over them. So first is our founding principles, because I think it's highly relevant. Um, Tonga's constitution, constitution um, international conventions, and just touching on religious freedom and how it's been challenged because of um, public health, especially during the recent pandemic. So. Religious freedom in Tonga holds um, immense significance because it's deeply ingrained in our history and in our culture, and it's part of our governance structure. In fact, uh, two things are foundational in Tonga's modern society and which most Tongans would identify with and hold dear, and that is our king's sacred covenant with God and our written constitution. So our written constitution is um, in three parts. So the first part is Declaration of Freedom, which is, has the inalienable rights, you know, freedom from slavery, freedom, um, habeas corpus, uh, not to be child twice. And so it, the basic human rights that you find everywhere are entrenched there, the freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, it's all in part one. And then in part two, we have um, the form of government, so as a parliamentary government, um, we subscribe to the Latma House principle of separation of powers. So we have a form of government, the legislature, the executive, which is governed by the cabinet, and of course the independent judiciary. And these, these are all enshrined in the form of government and we have accountability systems. So they, each branch of government hold each, holds each other into account. 
Um, and then there are systems for accountability within um, the constitution for government, like impeachment processes for our leaders and um, votes of no confidence for our prime minister. Um, those, those measures are, are under part two. And then one of the fundamental um, principles in Tonga is that we are tied to our land. And so we have this thing called um, registration where people's land rights are, are upheld under the constitution. Um, at the age of 16, um, every Tongan is entitled to a statutory amount of land. And um, this is a protection um, that was entered into the constitution because our founding king witnessed homelessness in, in the West and in, in Australia. And, and also the, the indigenous people of Hawaii being in alien, alienated from their land and corporations owning more of the land than the indigenous people. So that, that experience informed the, the formation of our constitution and ensured that our people would, would be protected. Um, uh, a sovereign people um, is nothing without language, uh, without um, family and people and without land. And so that was enshrined in our constitution. So the, the second part that I mentioned earlier is the king's covenant with God. And um, I, I could read the whole, the whole speech, which is basically um, King George de Bois I's prayer um, in 1839 at a place called Bawono, which is in the Northern Islands in Vavao. Um, but I think the most salient point there is at the very end of his prayer, he says, I give unto you my land and my people and all generations of people who follow after me. I offer them all to be protected from heaven, God and Tonga in my inheritance. And this really pulls at the strings, um, you know, because without this, Tonga would have no protection, no heavenly blessing. And um, I believe that all Tongans um, under this covenant have a sacred duty um, to uphold because he gave Tonga the land and all the people in perpetuity forever to God. And I think this is very special. So we have the Tongan flag, um, which was also um, brought into force uh, under the constitution. And you can see that um, the Christian values are reflected in that the, the red there represents the blood of Christ. And the cross is the cross of Christ and the white um, represents purity. So these motifs of Christianity um, in, in the formation of our modern kingdom um, follow through to the national motto, which is um, written in the bottom of the government seal. In, in English, plainly speaks, God and Tonga are my inheritance. And this is in government. So when you talk about the separation of church and state, it's implicit in our constitution. It's not explicitly stated there, but by reading the constitution and seeing some of the rights like the freedom of religion and especially the enshrined um, clauses on uh, the, the Holy Sabbath to be, to be remained holy and never to be uh, removed from the constitution. You, there, there are inferences there that the God that is protected in our constitution is the Christian God. So in Tonga's constitution, um, I want to highlight clause five, which is the freedom of worship, and clause six, which is the Sabbath day to be kept holy, because I think this is um, very relevant. In, in clause five, all men are free to practice the religion and to worship God as they may deem fit in accordance with what dictates um, their own worship, conscious and to assemble for religious services in such places as they may appoint. Um, but it shall not be lawful to use this freedom to commit evil and, um, and, and use religion to commit evil and acts that are, that are contrary to the laws of the nation. So freedom of worship in Tonga um, here 
1875, in fact, um, predates the, the United Nations um, Human Rights Declaration uh, by some 75 years. So um, I'm proud to say that um, our founding father, um, King George de the I, had this in mind and was actually quite forward thinking in ensuring that it was enshrined in our constitution, which cannot be changed up until today. Um, and this includes um, clause six of our constitution, which is the Sabbath day to be kept holy. Um, also uh, worth mentioning is Clause 7, uh, freedom of the press, which also relates to um, freedom of speech. Um, this has been challenged in, in recent times as um, some governments want to uh, hold reins over, over the press. But ultimately, um, freedom of the press and freedom of speech is maintained, and this is closely intertwined and related to freedom of um, religion. And, and the freedom to, to worship. So um, in terms of international conventions, um, I, I did mention this before, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, although Tonga has only been a member since 1999 um, of the United Nations, um, we had in, in, in effect, Article 18, Article 19, already harmonized in our constitution since um, it was formed 75 years earlier. Um, so uh, in terms of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, other articles have yet to be harmonized, but I, I have to say that I'm quite proud that 18 and 19 have already been adopted in Tonga and in practice prior to, to the United Nations acknowledgement of human rights. Um, in terms of other um, international conventions, uh, Tonga, under its uh, legal framework, has uh, become signatory to four other um, human rights charters, uh, namely um, racial discrimination, rights of a child, uh, disability, and um, the crime of genocide. Um, we, we discussed um, quite publicly um, the CEDAW, and, and it was a huge point of contention. There were marches and petitions in the country over CEDAW because of um, the strong Christian values that are held by the population. There were fears that CEDAW might be an entryway for other human rights um, that would be contrary to the, the existing religious beliefs in, in the country. the church leaders, uh, minority of the church leaders believe that the inherent health of the humans um, given by God <clears throat> was, was enough to counter um, the, the negative effects of a, of a global pandemic and therefore um, it wasn't necessary to, to be vaccinated. And so in, in, in the realms of, of um, legislation in our parliament, we had two vaccination bills that came through, a vaccination amendment bill and a public health amendment bill, which gave some emergency powers to the Minister of um, Health um, to effectively force vaccination on, on the population if the vaccination rates were not um, at a, um, at the required level to get um, mass immunity uh, for, for, for vaccination to be effective. Um, and, and that was met uh, by fierce opposition of, of two, two public petitions, which is a, a constitutional right of every Tongan to petition um, His Majesty the King and also Parliament on issues that they, they believe need to be relooked by our legislature. So, these, these petitions through the relevant committees in Parliament um, were, were discussed um, and Parliament 
decided it was um, in the best interest of the nation to pass the, the vaccination amendment and the public health bill, uh, despite the concerns. However, um, amendments were incorporated into the bills to ensure that no one was forced to vaccine if they held religious beliefs counter to the vaccination. Um, and so effectively, um, nobody was forced to vaccine in Tonga. And even then, we reached one of the highest vaccination rates in, in the world at 88% fully vaccinated. I think first vaccination was something like 98%. Second dose was, I think, 94%. And then um, the fully vaccination, including the, um, the booster shot, was around 88 so um, despite the concerns and um, despite freedom of religion being contra to, to public health, um, it, it all worked out. And in fact, Tonga had one of the best um, experiences of COVID-19. We closed down hard and early and our borders were hard closed for two years. In those two years, we had no community transmission. And so everyone was just free to to, to live as they pleased. Um, they, we didn't really wear masks. Um, there was really no social distancing for two years. And then when we finally had um, community transmission, um, within six months, we opened our borders. So um, I, I have to say that uh, we, we were lucky and, and, and somewhat blessed in that our experience was not as bad as, as some of the other countries. And the deaths from, from COVID-19 were I think it was like 18 or something like that. Um, it was um, very, very low compared to some of the other countries that were hard hit. Um, I've got three more pages to read to you. I'm just reading the room and I think um, I'd, I'd rather have more of an open discussion of a, of a Q and A, and uh, but I, I did have here some concerns about Tonga's um, religious freedom in the future, um, because uh, Christianity, being considered as the state religion, is sort of by de facto um, that freedom of religion could be challenged um, if the prevailing religion was to change from, say, Christianity to Islam or Buddhism or something like that, then I think um, a lot of the closely held beliefs that are enshrined in our constitution might be challenged in the future if, if that happens. These are just hypothetical scenarios, but um, that, that could be um, a real concern for freedom of religion in the future. So I think in, in, summing, uh, in summing up, Tonga has upheld uh, freedom of religion. We have a largely secular um, government, although um, there are hints of Christianity sprinkled throughout our, our constitution. And in terms of practice, um, we, we hold ourselves as, as a Christian country. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for those two presentations. We do have some time for some question and answers. And so I'd like to start by asking Senator George and then Lord Fakafanua, are, are, do you have women senators in the Federated Republic of Micronesia? And if not, uh, can, can, can they participate in the governmental process? And then same question for, for Kingdom of Tonga. Yes, <clears throat> I will speak for Kusrai. Uh, it's the first time this year that there's a woman in the senator elected in the general election in November last year. And she, she's now seated with us at the legislature in Kusrai. And this, there was an election in July this year. And the very first time Koshai elected a woman to send it to Congress, to Micronesia, Micronesia Congress, happened July of this year. And this happened to be my sister, 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll start with my sister is not a member of parliament, <laughs> um, but in, in Tonga we have one elected um, female representative and one non-elected appointed by a prime minister um, who's our mem minister of um, tourism and foreign affairs. We, we don't really have a good history of, of women representation in Tonga. Um, although I've been advocating for women representation for, for a long time. In fact, my late auntie was the first member of, female member of parliament um, to be elected. And she was elected some 20 years after um, Tonga had universal suffrage. So you can see it's been a very long um, progress for us to introduce women into parliament. And my, my own personal opinion from my experience is that a lot of women are not too keen to get into politics um, because they view it as being a, um, very dirty and they're, um, mm -hmm. and they're not wrong. Um, however, uh, we do need women in parliament because uh, their unique perspective is needed, um, especially when we're considering legislation that affects both men and women and, and families. And so I think it's something that we might be able to change over the next generation I think current women who we need in Parliament uh, don't want to come into Parliament right now. If it wasn't so divisive and so contentious and so antagonistic, more women would probably be more excited to participate, right? Mm -hmm. Other questions? Please, Todd. Question for Lord Fakafanua. Uh, you mentioned the diaspora of Tonga. Maybe half of, half of all Tongans live outside of Tonga. In fact, you, you probably know this, but our football coach here at BYU, Kalani Sataki, is Tonga. Um, my question was, what happens if someone joins another church, in, uh, say, non-Christian church, outside of Tonga, and then returns and, say, wants to observe the Sabbath on a different day? Uh, how does that work within their construct? Um, we, we respect... Um freedom of religion. So as long as their rights um, don't override the rights that are granted to everyone in Tonga, then they're free to practice their own religion. Um, the Holy Sabbath, according to our constitution, is the Sunday. Um, however, we have a seventh day um, in, in Tonga, and they, their Sabbath is um, Saturday. My, my wife is a seventh day, so... <laughs> Um, they, they don't object to the Holy Sabbath that's enshrined in the Constitution. Um, if anything, that provision predates their religion in our country. So it, it's not going to be a problem if it's a peaceful religion. We, we respect their space and their rights. They've got it figured out. They have a day of rest on Saturday and on Sunday in the Faka Fanua home, and so that must be kind of nice. Yes. Wonder, just a follow-up question. There was an indigenous religion prior to, uh, I don't know, maybe prior to King George uh, converting to Christianity. Has there been a resurgence of that indigenous religion, or is it just gone? I, uh, no. Uh, well, yes and no. Well, when 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 King George um, the first accepted Christianity. Um, creating the written constitution was part of codifying some of those laws um, that took us away from, from uh, pre-Christianity, uh, as in like freeing the slaves, giving people rights, and um, all, all of that was part of his shift away from, from pre-Christianity. In fact, um, I don't know if you can see on his photo there, but his pinky, um, is, is no longer there. It was cut as a sacrifice uh, to, his, to his old gods. And basically what he wanted for the future of his people was that for that practice not to happen. Um, I had a slide that I removed 
about pre-constitution, <laughs> and it had um, things like slavery and. So that um, was all part of the indigenous religion. It was all part of the indigenous yes. re religion before there was human sacrifice. There were, you know, sacrifice of body parts and things like that. And he he saw the light and wanted his um, descendants to to turn away from the darkness and and not have to sacrifice their pinky and things like that. <laughs> So he, he, he was quite a um, formidable foe for those who opposed his Christianity. Um, so we're very fortunate to have such a, a forward-thinking leader that could unite the kingdom and, and bring it under the written, written constitution under Christianity. A quick question for uh, Senator Sasaki George. Is there an indigenous religion in the Federation of Micronesia or a state-sponsored religion, or tell, just to give us a quick uh, summary of the religious landscape with your country. The test. Yes, there's, there was an indigenous religion, and with the arrival of the missionaries, I think back in 1852, the the old religion slowly passed out, passed out, and it's no longer practiced publicly. But there has been a rise in Kusrai about people practicing the old secret art. Like, uh, I think it's, we may call it witchcraft or black magic, things like that. To Gain to make gain for themselves. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Question. Justice uh, Fensball. My question is for uh, Lord uh, Fakafanua. So the, the limitations on the second limb of the Clause 5 freedom to, of worship, uh, it shall not be lawful to use this freedom to commit evil and live, I can't say that word, yes. 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 Uh, acts or under the name of worship to do what is contrary to the law and peace of the land. So if you are peacefully um, conducting your, your religion and your worship, then you're not acting contrary to um, the clause five of the constitution. So the limitation is that as long as you're not doing evil things, and I think evil there is quite a wide, um, quite, quite a wide and open um, statement there in the constitution. So I think evil would be things like um, uh, demon worshipping where you're like uh, sacrificing humans or, you know. What about uh, national security and public order? Uh, that, that would be under the, there's a national security clause uh, for the security of the nation and and also um, tre treason? There's, there's a treason act mm -hmm. if, if you're doing anything contrary to the um, security of the nation and against the, the king. There's a sedition and, and treason section in the constitution that covers that. But in terms of freedom, um, we have open freedom for religion. Licentious, promiscuous and unprincipled in sexual matters or disregarding accepted rules or conventions, especially in grammar or literary style. So I think that the licentious that King, your first king had in mind was not the literary uh, sort of things that might happen, but maybe the former. Other I, have, I have a question to my friend from Samoa. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 um, if, if he had a religion in mind he was thinking of when, when you, you were asking if um, that could be forbidden in Tawa. 
if there was a religion you had in mind for Tonga yeah. um, that might be banned? Did you have something in mind? Um, yes, because uh, in Samoa we have some similarities in, in our constitution. And uh, in Samoa we have some uh, limitations when we exercise a person's freedom of religion in terms of uh, national security and public orders, as well as health, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation. So those uh, limitations that affect uh, the freedom, freedom of religion of, uh, of any persons in Samoa. So can, can, as, a, as a Buddhist, can I come and uh, open a Zen temple in Samoa? Um, or a congregation? Because uh, Samoa is found in the court the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as long as it's within that uh, principles. So we accept whatever Christianity. But uh, according to our constitution, like I said, Samoa founded on God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How about in, Bo uh, in Tonga? Can I open my Zen Buddhist temple? Yes. Yes, you can in Tonga. Okay. And in Micronesia, may I? practice my Buddhism. There was a established in Kusrai, I think about 10 years ago, a Muslim center. For the question of uh, Hindu, I think it would be very difficult because the last time it was for the I mean, the Muslim, it caused a lot of controversy. Mm. And one to come right after that, I think it's going to be difficult to do that. Okay, thank you. Well, just to add, on, uh, in Samoa, we have Baha'i and Muslim for your information. Thank you. All right, we have time for maybe one more question for our, our guests. And if you don't have a question, then I'll finish with one final question. What do you think of Utah? <laughs> <laughs> I've read about Utah, and I really admire the pioneers that came to Utah. And when I came to Utah, I began to see the place when we go around, and I, I, feel, I feel really good. I feel like I'm warm. I like Utah. Very good. Uh, other, other than maybe I saw the uh, Georges up at Sundance the other night, and they had their jackets on, and then they had another sweatshirt over the top. <laughs> and so it was a little cold for you compared to what you're used to in Micronesia. And Lord Fakafanua has actually skied Park City before. But other than that, what do you think of Utah? I, I, I think Utah is... Um, probably the, the furthest thing from the islands <laughs> that you can think of. It's like the, the complete antithesis of like an island. It, there's, there's no ocean, but you have these beautiful mountains and there's snow and you have four seasons. Um, yeah, it's just so foreign to us. And, and despite that, I think it's very beautiful. Yes. Well, on behalf of those of us who are from Utah, we again express our appreciation that you would take the time that you would come and share in the common values that we are trying to espouse here at this uh, society conference. And if you will all join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>